from the second letter of Peter, chapter 1, starting in verse 2. May grace and peace be yours in abundance in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything needed for life and for godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Thus, he has given us through these things his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may escape from the corruption that's in the world because of lust and may become participants in the divine nature. For this very reason, you must make every effort to support your faith with goodness and goodness with knowledge and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with endurance, and endurance with godliness, and godliness with mutual affection, and mutual affection with love. For if these things are yours and are increasing among you, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I have definitely tapped a nerve with this series. I've, I've lost track of the number of people who've told me about their desire to find an exercise program that works for them, to start a new job, to begin a business, to conceive of something new in their life, to start a prayer group, to start a small group, to change their diet, and maybe begin to live more healthy. All of these things, including reaching onto the shelf of that spiritual book that you bought years ago that you haven't read, all kinds of things. Clearly, we've tapped a nerve with this series as we're discovering what you want. And, and I just want to say how proud I am of you. I want you to keep this up. Keep telling me what you're doing. Keep telling me the things that you're about because it makes a big difference. This series, Whatever you, are, whatever you want, is about us beginning to partner with God in living our lives, our everyday lives, our walking around, eating, sleeping kind of lives. This series, Whatever You Want, is, is about us becoming what we want, knowing that our desires shape us and form us into a particular kind of people. This series, Whatever You Want, is about learning that our effort matters. The things that we do, the investment that we make, indeed matters a lot. And so we begin this journey with trusting God and adding to that trust, not just faith in some cognitive ideas, but action. Action and virtue that supports that love of God. Well, today, today we continue with our means of looking at the how-tos. And I, I provide for you one more piece of the puzzle. No, it's not really a piece of the puzzle. It's more like the frame, the straight edges of the frame, to focus our attention clearly on what we do. These regular practices of our lives as we try to be good or bad in this crazy world. You know, it, it takes resolve, it takes diligence to have a settled focus, to know where you're going, to know that you're focused in a God direction, and to have that decision clearly made for you so that you can begin to focus on all aspects of your life and arrange the pieces of your life so they head towards that goal. Well, that brings us to where I've been driving for this entire series, to a word that's bigger than just a word, but a word that makes us think deeply about our lives. And so I'm going to be up front with you. I'm going to tell you what that word is, and I'm going to give you a phrase in a minute that's the main thing I'm about today. And the word is habit. Habit. These practices that we do repeatedly in our lives. Now, if you flip to a dictionary, you can pick whichever one you want, Webster's or Oxford or wherever. There's usually going to be two groups of definitions. One definition is going to be very familiar to us, and the other definition may be a quite a bit less familiar. 
Well, that first one is about having this, this way of life, these actions or practices that are driven down deep into our lives through repetition. Habits. Sometimes these habits are good, and some of us, we've got those habits that are bad, that we don't want. But it's through repetition, as we live our lives, that we create this behavior. Some of it might just be an ingrained behavior that we've had a long time. Another might be an acquired behavior where we're trying to teach ourselves, we're trying to train ourselves in a new way of living. This understanding of habit, this number one definition, is about how we act really without even thinking. Getting to the point where we naturally do certain things. All right, now that one's pretty familiar, right? Nod your heads if that's what you would have said on habit. Yeah, it's pretty familiar. Well, the other one is clothing, of course. That's the other big definition of habit. Did you know that? One of the primary definitions of a habit in terms of clothing, that's the, the next one, is of a religious order. A habit is something that different religious orders take on as their clothing. So think about, probably first and foremost, you think of a nun, right? The dress of a nun, the headdress, certain color, right? Or of a monk, or of a priest. They have a particular way of living. They've, they've given up their clothing that separates them, that might be distinctive, like me wearing blue today, and they've given it up for a different color, maybe black, or brown, or blue. Now, that may mean nothing to you. Okay, so now we know that a nun might call her clothing a habit, or a priest might call his a habit. Okay, but what does that mean for us? We're not as focused in on clothing, right? Well, what about some of our careers? Some of the things that we do for a living. Do police officers have a habit? They do. What about the UPS driver? What color do they wear? All right, what about the gal that's helping you at Best Buy? What color? What about that clerk at Target? Huh, this is interesting. Well, what about if we were to meet the volleyball team? We wouldn't be able to pick out the color, but we would see that they all have the same color on, the same logos. You get where I'm going with this. Our dress is something of an example of how we live our lives. Now, I bring that up because I want us to think about very deeply and intently our practices. Because in the case of religious orders, they're focused in on practices that align up with their clothing, even eliminating distraction to say, this is what I'm about, this is who I will be. And if, as far as us and where we're going today, as we focus in on the how, the means, here's what I want you to catch. So if you catch this, you can drift off to sleep and you will have accomplished what, I, no, please don't do that. Stop it, even if you're online, wake up, get out of your PJs, you know, sit up, sit up straight, look alive. <laughs> no, this is what I want you to get, that in this series of whatever you want, it is not so much about what you get as who you are becoming. That's what we're after. Not the things that we want and we desire, but who we are becoming. What's the kind of person that we are? And that's more than externals. That's more than wearing a certain color of clothing. That goes much deeper. That pushes us past the things that we get. Where our, our identity is not shaped by how much stuff we can fit in our garage or into our car or into a storage container. We're not so much focused on those things as much as we are who we are and who we are becoming. So think about yourself. Do you find yourself becoming more and more angry? Do you find yourself becoming less and less patient with other people? Do you find yourself in your life as you grow older becoming more and more demanding less and less patient with slow drivers? Do you find yourself, as you get older in life, surrounding yourself with people who agree with you, who think you've got it all together, who share the same opinions? Or do you find yourself 
spending less and less time with older, wiser, more experienced voices. We have to think about the kind of people that we are becoming. And so that's why we've opened up this letter. That's why we've been looking at 2 Peter and spending time over these weeks diving into this very formal, ancient virtue list that Peter, who walked with Jesus, constructed and left for us as an example of how we could follow in the path of Jesus. And I want these to be something that you internalize. In fact, if you're looking for something to memorize, 2 Peter 1, 1 through 11, this would be a good one. Not just to get up in our heads, which would be a great start, but to externalize to where it becomes who we are and how we act. Something more than just what we wear, but how we live in this world. Well, in this place, uh, we've been looking in in chapter 1 and looking at eight things that Peter shares. And I want you to look up on the screen at, at these things. We've been looking at them a few each week. So in the first week, we looked at faith and we looked at virtue. In the second week, we looked at knowledge, self-control, and perseverance. And today, we're going to look at those last three, this path of godliness, mutual affection, and love. And we'll come back to this graphic in a minute and take it a little bit further. But for now, I want to turn your attention to those final three. Three habits, three things that help us with this how-to become more and more like God. So let's take the first one. This first habit, this way of acting, acting in the world that can be something that we repeat is godliness. Now, even just saying it out loud, godliness, that's probably going to make some irreligious people say, ah, that doesn't fit into my virtue list. I'm not so drawn to that. In fact, I think godliness probably for us in New Mexico might sound a little pretentious, right? If, if that's a goal of godliness, well, let's go a little further. This idea of godliness really means reverence or awe or worship. It's like someone falling back in reverence. So think about your own life. We don't have to just turn straight to God. Think about those times in your life when you just are overcome with awe. Maybe it's of a beautiful mountain, a picturesque sunset. Or what about a beautiful person? What about a job that's really well done, where you just feel good about it? Or you look at a paint job on a custom motorcycle, and it's perfect. Or you hear an engine that's been perfectly tuned, and it's humming and ready to race down the highway. There are times, and those are maybe trivial for a lot of us, but for some of us, maybe they're significant where you're in awe, you get a sense of something beyond yourself, something bigger than you. When it comes to Christians, we have a direction for that awe, a place that we're looking to, and that's God. Whenever we have those moments, we are giving our attention and our worship of God. And it can be a little bit more down to earth to just think not just about God as far away, but in those moments where God is present in every moment, where God is instructing us about our life, to have a sense of the sacred in the moments of our life. With Christians, people that follow Jesus, we have a direction for that worship and for that awe. We believe that we've, all of us, have been made in the image of God. Even those of us who don't believe we're made in the image of God, we believe that all are made in the image of God. And while that's our birthright, that's who we are, we strive to live in the likeness of God. We try to be like God. That's what our aim is, to become more and more like the one who made us. It's a lot like our heroes, where we imitate their mannerism. We want to get their swing just right. We want to duplicate how they talk or how they conduct themselves in business or in life or with their family. We imitate them. All right, well, that's godliness. That's the first one. The second two get us to the very top of this virtue list. Yes, they're last, but this is the pinnacle. Number two for today is mutual affection. And I kind of struggle with this one. This is a word that is familiar to us. Philadelphia, right? Brotherly love. It's love for your family. 
Love for those that are close to you. Yes, I know, sometimes it's hard to love those that are close to you. Sometimes our family is difficult. But we have that baseline of DNA, of being in close proximity, of common experience where we do love one another. And with Christians, Peter's pointing us to love one another. In fact, the witness that Christians have in this world for outsiders is the way that we love one another. That should be scary for all of us. Because when we're not good at loving each other, at showing respect for one another, people don't tend to buy what we say. They don't believe what we have to offer. And the world would do well, especially in these days, to see and experience the love that Christians have for one another, right? I mean, this world needs love now more than ever. Mutual love. This is kind of an insider love. This is a love towards those that are close to us. Well, the pinnacle, the supreme, the, the, supreme, the queen, is love. The third one. Love takes us further than just the insider love. This is a universal love. A universal love that's not just for those that are close by, but those that we don't know. Those that we don't like. Those that might even be our enemies or our opponents. How are we showing love to them? You've probably been around Christians and church leaders who tend to focus really heavily on loving those that are on the inside. Maybe inside their denomination or inside their religion. And we tend to focus there and then stop and speak ill or speak badly about those who are outside or think that an opponent is somehow bad. Sometimes I wonder if we were to come across someone who has very little experience with Christianity, maybe they've never been a Christian in their life, but they know about us, and we tell them, you know what the supreme queen virtue of Christianity is? And we tell them it's love. Would they be shocked? I think some people would. Some outsiders would be surprised if we told them that's what we're all about because that's not the experience that they see. And I know that it gets distorted. It's not exactly accurate. But when they see what we stand for or who we leave out or who we choose not to take care of or love or what laws we tend to pass, it's difficult. We're looking at Peter, but Paul wrote about this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2 to have love for one another and for all. It's incomplete if it's just on the inside and not for those on the outside. So if we're followers of Jesus, we need to lead in love. Our reverence for God, our worship of God, leads us to love one another, to where we can love each other as God loves one another, and to take that step beyond to love the stranger, the one who's difficult to love, the one who's hard to be around. Now, in some ways we tend to write off our opponents or write off people who do evil. And we forget what a benefit it is to have evil out there. We know that evil shows us the goodness of God. As, as evil and bad as wickedness is, it shows us how good God is. And is it possible for us to hate and to run from evil, to not want to participate at all, and yet still embrace those who are caught up in evil, who need to see that universal love, who need to see a Christian that will treat them as a human being? That is a message that someone can hear because they can see it. And it separates us from just being successful or just focusing in on our what we gain, not just choosing sides, not just picking who's a winner or villainizing others, but reaching out to the one who's different than us. At a fundamental level, what this looks like is wanting what's best for another. If you really get at the core of what love is, it's to, to will and to desire what is best for that other person. So can we do that by upholding good, standing for what's good, and yet want what is best for those who are caught up and trapped in evil? Okay, well, I told you that I'd return to this order. Those are the three things that we're looking at today. 
This is where we've been over the last few weeks of this series. I want you to pay close attention to a couple of words here. Do you notice how it starts and how it ends? It begins with faith and ends at the peak of love. It begins with our trust in God, our reliance upon God, and then our loving in the way that God loves. I think that's very valuable for us to to see of what Peter has laid out for us. Well, each week I've kind of broken this down, and so we've looked at, at groups of two and three. So let's look at the first word of each group. Each one of these words is focused in on directly on God. Faith. We are putting our trust in God, our reliance and our belief in God. Something bigger than us. Knowledge. When we talked about knowledge just a couple of weeks ago, I explained this isn't just cognitive knowledge, book knowledge about God. This is relational knowledge with God. Living in partnership with God. And then finally, what we've already gone into today at some length of godliness, of wanting to be like God. Trusting God, living in relationship with God, and wanting to be like God. And the other words give us more means, give us more example of how we can be virtuous, of how we can act on this. Being disciplined and self-controlled, enduring through difficult times, and showing love, the queen of all virtues. Well, these habits are worth holding up and looking at very carefully and worth memorizing because they shape us and make us who we are. If these become our sustained action, if these become the way that we repetitively live each day and each hour, it shapes us. It molds us into a certain kind of person. It helps us to get where we want to go, which is to be like God. I want to give you a couple of ancient words beyond Scripture that point to some of these principles. In fact, you've probably heard a lot of people talk about habits, and since we've been driving towards habits today on the last of this series, I want to point us all the way back to Aristotle. Aristotle was known in his Nicomachean Ethics. Don't worry, you don't have to spell that. You don't have to know how to spell that. But he basically makes the point that we are what we repeatedly do. Closer to our time, a historian, Will Durant, took that and explained this. So let me read you what Will Durant said about Aristotle. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. Some great things there about repetition, who we are repeatedly on a daily basis, and not getting so hung up in that we did that one good thing that one time right? It's, it's something that happens over and over again. Excellence is sustained over the long haul. Well, let me show you one more. This is one from uh, more of a spiritual writer. With, his name is Hesychos, and it's a little more abstract, but there's a couple of phrases that are loaded, and you might cling on, you might grab on to one of them. In virtue, as in vice, Constancy is the mother of habit. Once acquired, it rules us by nature. What's true for virtue is true for vice. The things that you have constantly in your repertoire shape you. They become like your mother. And in time, they will rule you by nature. That means If you give yourself over to vice, the more and more that you do that, the more you will be ruled by that nature. If you allow your mind to take control of your body and begin to pursue the things that are good, the more and more choices that you put together that are good, you begin to rule your nature in the path of God, in the path of goodness. Well, these are all actions that help us get to where we want to go. And I want you to hear one more time that the good life is not about what we get. It's not about our desires. It's about who we are becoming. Who we are becoming as people. The choices that we are making in this present moment. A choice that I hope will be one to be like God. To be like the one that loves those even when they don't love him. 
to be like one who serves and gives even when we don't serve and give to him. As people who are following Jesus, our identification, who we are, is those that are following after Jesus, which means if Jesus is who we desire, we're wanting to become like Jesus. We want to become Christ-like, and that's going to require of us effort. We don't just get hit in the head over this. We partner with God and what God is doing in our lives, starting from the inside, moving to the outside. Not just having to wear a certain color or a certain costume, something on the outside to show people, hey, this is who I am. No, starting from the inside and going to the outside, supporting our life with these eight things that we've looked at so carefully. Well, I hope this look at taking a focus on our vision of who we want to be and what we want to become, deciding and intending that that's what we're going to be about, and then putting in place in our lives the means, arranging the, the aspects of our lives to actually accomplish being like God, living in the kingdom of God, becoming a good person. Let's pray. God, thank you for being a good God. A God without whose grace we could not do this. And so we pray what what Peter tells us to pray, that we would abound in more and more grace and peace. That's what we want in our lives. We need more and more grace. Would you help us on this journey of becoming like your son? Would you fill us with your spirit? Provide us every resource we need to be like you. Thank you that you haven't left us alone, but you're with us on this journey. Thank you that we're not alone even in this room or wherever we're listening to these words, that we can do it together with the other followers of Jesus that gather in this place. We pray all this through Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen.